Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero, and it's time for the Nintendo Power Retrospective Part 7. That. Now, since we're on the first issue of Nintendo Power, well, we might as well ask, nah, start over. Hello, and welcome to Part 7 of the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. A Breaking It All Down production, as you saw from my brand snazzy new opening credit sequence. Yep, how about that? We're starting into the magazine proper, we're starting at the part which I grew up on, and probably some of you out there did, and some of you are too young to ha remember. God, I feel old. Anyway, so, yeah, that's cool, and we might as well get started with Nintendo Power number one. For July and August of 1988. Our cover game for this issue is Super Mario Bros. 2. Now, this cover of the magazine is fairly iconic. Indeed, the cover of the last issue of Nintendo Power paid homage to this one. Still, Mario looks a little off-model in this diorama. I think it's the hat. I believe the hat's supposed to be red instead of blue here, but other than that, it's a perfectly good cover. After our table of contents, we get right into the thick of things with the Super Mario Bros. 2 article. We get a rundown of all four of the playable characters and their strengths and weaknesses before getting into the biggest change from the original Super Mario Bros. No longer do you defeat your enemies by jumping on them. Instead, to defeat them, you must throw things at them, either vegetables pulled out of the ground or other enemies. Also, instead of having Super Mario and Normal Mario, you have a hit point gauge, which shrinks you down to normal Mario once you're on your last hit point. And we also have images of all the game's enemies. However, aside from this, the other really significant thing about this article is the fact that from here we on we have the thing that Nintendo Power is most famous for. The maps. The big, for the time, beautiful screenshot maps. Consider the time at the time screenshots were Photographs, so a series of photographs taken of the screen every basically screen width or so, or so and spliced together. And you can imagine the amount of time and effort, effort it would take to do that. You can imagine how much work it would have taken to put into a single issue of Nintendo Power, even just one article of Nintendo Power. So, and we get multiples of these. We get um, maps for this article covering worlds 1 and 2. And from henceforth, every issue will have several of these per game. So, it is really impressive with all the maps we're getting here. As far as the game itself goes, Super Mario Bros. 2 has kind of gotten a bit of a bad rap from Mario fan some Mario fanboys and some retro gamers for not being a true Mario game. And to be fair, it did not begin its life as a Super Mario Bros. title. It was designed by Shigeru Miyamoto, but it, was, but it was originally designed as Doki Doki Panic, a sort of promotional game for the Famicom Disk System, and it was changed for its US release um, basically when Nintendo of America said, hey, the Japanese version of Super Mario Bros. 2 is absurdly hard and kind of wants to kick gamers in the teeth, let's try something a little less nasty. And honestly, I think that this version of Super Mario Bros. 2 is the better game. Yes, the gameplay is different. You're not jumping on enemies right away to defeat them, so it's basically kind of not intuitive if you're coming from any other game in the Mario series. But really, if you're skipping out of this game for the reasons of it's different, it wasn't born as a Mario game, you're missing out on a really fun game. The controls are just as good as all the other games in the series. You don't need the Fire Flower or anything like that to make a good Mario game. This one does just fun on its own. Picking up and throwing enemy enemies and items is intuitive. It's not hard to pick up the little tricks you can do to throw in different directions or what have you. It is a excellent game just to slip into the groove of it. Like with Mario 1, once you figure out the little tricks and about it, and there aren't that many of them, and they're really easy to learn, then it's easy to just excel at this game and just have lots of fun. Is it the best Mario game? No. We will be getting to what is, in my opinion, the best Mario game ever, well, uh, ever later. But it is a worthy addition to the franchise and definitely a game that is worth your money and your time. 
next is The Legend of Zelda. Now, I had said I'd refrain from revisiting games unless there was something to talk about. Well, here's something to talk about. The second quest. Basically, with lots of NES games at the time, once you beat the game the first time around, the game would give you an opportunity to go through the game again, but with a higher difficulty, some things changed, and that sort of thing. Um, Mario Brothers did this. I don't believe Metroid did this, but um, you, you come across this in games, particularly ones which had some sort of arcade basis. And Legend of Zelda kind of took this up as well by introducing the second quest, where it played just like the first quest, except the locations of dungeons were changed, um, dungeons were populated with different enemies than they were the first time around, and some of the resources were more spare, more sparing and harder to come by. Also, you'd start off basically the way you would in the first quest. You would have no weapons until you walked up to the cave and got the sword from the guy saying it's dangerous to go alone. So, this article features maps of the first six dungeons and the basic shapes of the last three, seven through ten, as well as a combined map for the first and second quest, as well as a more in-depth map for the second quest, so you can find where everything is. Basically, it's all you really need to get started in the game on the second quest. Frankly, the second quest is noticeably harder than the first one. Once you enter the dungeon, the game throws harder enemies at you more quickly than when you face them in the first game. As an example, in the first dungeon, when you play through the first time, you're facing off against the bats and the water droplets earlier on, and you don't face the boomerang guys until relatively later in. You're still fighting them in the first dungeon, but you're not fighting as many of them. Here, right off the bat, you are facing the uh, boomerang guys who have a name. I don't remember what it is, but that's okay. Also, the first dungeon has, in the first half, only one key leaving you to make a resource use decision of do I use this to get the map or do I use this to get through the basically the first door once you go through this, the secret passage unless you've looked at the map you'll know you, you probably will use it earlier so you can get the map in the dungeon as opposed to the map from Nintendo Power and thus when you get to that next locked door you then have to backtrack and basically grind for enough money to buy another key so you can go back into the dungeon and unlock this next door. Um, so there's that there, to kind of give you a, a sample of the difficulty in this first part of the game. Would I consider the second quest as essential as playing the first? No. But that said, it's not bad, it's not cheap in terms of difficulty is concerned. I again, I mentioned that the monster placement and stuff, frankly, that's in the dungeons. In the overworld, all the monsters you're facing are in the same places where they usually are. Early off, when you come out, you're fighting Octorox, you're fighting the same red Octorox, you're not like you're suddenly facing a whole bunch of blue Octorox, which take multiple hits. So it's not actively trying to do backstab you or sabotage your gameplay or anything like that. It is more difficult, but in a more fair fashion. The ending isn't dramatically different, it's on YouTube if you want to find it. Um, it's not like you're not getting a true ending if you beat the game, um, in just the first quest, you don't go this way, but you do get a slightly different ending. Really, the main reason for going through the second quest again is bragging rights. If you've beaten the game and you have nothing else on your plate, and you just feel like playing more Legend of Zelda, perfect good reason to go through the second quest again, but you, well, or go through the second quest, but you don't have to... It won't hurt your gameplay experience to not go through it. Actually, to a certain extent, the second quest is kind of the thing that achievements really feel like they were made for us. Back in the day, if you beat the first and second quest, all you really have is word of mouth. Say, oh, to say your buddies, oh yeah, I beat the second quest too. Unless you videotape your gameplay or something like that, or you replayed through it again with your friends there to prove to them that yes, you beat the second quest. And in that case, that would probably take a while unless you were speedrunning. Um, and actually, this by basically playing the second quest this time, it does make me wish that Nintendo had found a way to do something with achievements in the Virtual Console. So that, for example, if you played Legend of Zelda, it, you, got, you got an achievement for beating the game, you got an achievement, say, based on time or whatever, say if you speedrun through it, 
and then maybe it gives you and man and it gives you an achievement for beating the second quest that would be really cool um so i just wish they'd figure out a way to incorporate something like this in the legend of in the virtual console or achievements in the virtual console for games like the legend of zelda we now enter the realm of the sports game with the baseball game roundup each game gets a selection of screenshots all divided by categories based on particular concepts like rosters and that sort of thing and a few notes for how each game not so much rates but information about each game in these specific categories with games which do better in certain categories getting more information than others they don't explicitly say oh for example this game has better rosters or provide informa more information but they will spend more time talking about how it presents information or how it handles fielding or graphics than in other than for other games in the same category the article covers three games bases loaded from Jalico, rbi baseball from namco and tengen developed by namco published by tengen and major league baseball from ljn bases loaded is an interesting game it has a, some things which are really going for it the game uses digitized speech and intuitive fielding controls including having characters head to move under pop flies on their own rather than you having to move them there when the characters aren't necessarily on camera yet, so you can't see where they're going. Also, the camera angle works really well for pitching, where it, the camera is behind the pitcher instead of being behind the batter, so it lets you aim your pitches a little better and control speed and that sort of stuff better. Though, as a consequence, it doesn't work quite as well for batting. The game even gives you a whole bunch of useful information in terms of your pitcher's ERA, um, your batter's batting average, that sort of thing. Though I found that when it comes to the team that's being controlled by the player, ERA doesn't matter much. The earned run average doesn't matter much. As I was playing a pitcher with a fairly high earned run average, which is, which is bad if you don't know baseball. But I was still doing fairly well. It may be that he was tiring out sooner or his top speed for his pitches was lower, but that's the only real influence I saw when it comes to stats on pitching performance. The game also gives you a whole bunch of useful presentation stuff. For example, when there's a home run or substitution, it plays a little cutscene, just giving you something to look at. The difficulty is also reasonable, and it doesn't do any sort of rubber banding in the sense of, if you're doing poorly, you don't all of a sudden start hitting more home runs, but on the same side of the coin, if you're doing really well, your opponent won't suddenly start belting out home runs, getting lots of runners on base, hitting the ball right between outfielders, letting them hit doubles or get doubles or triples just to close up the score on the game. Even though you're not playing any real world teams, nor are you fielding any real world players, the game is still fun to play. RBI Baseball, on the other hand, is kind of disappointing. The fielding is clunky. You're basically moving all of your fielders at once, which means that you might end up moving your first baseman into the foul area while you're trying to get an outfielder into position to catch a pop fly or a grounder that blasts between bases or what have you. I am also had problems with baseman locking. Basically, where I have a, a grounder going right past the second baseman, and theoretically, the second baseman just took a few steps to the side, he could pick up the ball, run back to base, and then throw it to first, or even tag out the runner that was hitting for second. But he didn't do that, or I couldn't have him do that, because he would just lock there and I couldn't move him. Speaking of locking, whenever a player picks up the ball, he locks in place and does not move unless you either have him throw the ball or you use B and a button re uh, relating to whatever base you want to have him run towards to have him run in. Thus, consequently, I've had situations where I've had outfielders who were way too far out in the outfield to th properly throw a ball in who basically weren't able to do so and leading to runners getting on base. I couldn't have them run forward a bit sooner before having them throw. Um, on the batting side of things, honestly, either the swing for the batter is too short or the batter's box and the home plate are way too big. Because I'm having, because I had a problem with the game where I would be swinging at pitches and I should be hitting it, but the bat feels, looks so short that like it, the batter is bunting every single time. The bat does not go all the way over the plate. And further, the game uses rubber banding in the difficulty. And one game, I went for about six innings without getting a run, and then all of a sudden, I was hitting home runs like I was watching a contemporary baseball game on television, 
and I had, oh, I don't know, who, who are the kids watching on baseball these days? I had um, Alex Rodriguez at the plate. So, um, and honestly, I was disappointed by RBI Baseball. I'd heard good things about it. I'd heard that the game still has a major following and that lots of people are doing edits and mods to it to update players with current stats, update the teams with current players and all that sort of stuff and that sort of thing. And I'm disappointed that this game does not live up to that. It's it's a bad baseball game, but not as bad as the game I'm going to be talking about next. As far as Major League Baseball goes, well, as this game came out before LGN was bought out by Acclaim and it was developed by Atlas, I had hopes that it might not be bad. I hoped that I was coming in before LJN became synonymous with the rainbow of crap, and I was wrong. Oh boy, was I wrong. In FAQ, I referenced to get the controls for the game before I played it. it said that with the right knowledge on how to exploit the game's bugs and flaws, you could never lose a game against the computer. And I decided since I wanted an accurate and good gameplay experience as far as a replication of a normal gameplay experience as opposed to someone trying to exploit the game, I would play it without trying to exploit those flaws, and I ended up getting curb stomped. The problem is, whenever the opposing team was at bat, it's like they un unerringly managed to put the ball between my outfielders every time. And this was aggravated by the fact that the game has the same sluggish feeling as RBI Baseball on fielding. Batting, well, it's better than RBI Baseball, but that's damning with faint praise. Um, as, honestly, the opposing team seemed to bat a thousand times better than I did. I don't mean like in terms of just hitting the ball, that's that's on me. I mean like once you hit the ball, how far it ends up going. They were hitting home runs, to reuse an analogy, like all their players were A-Rod, while I was hitting like, well, I was playing in the 80s or 70s. It, I mean, I got some home runs on occasion, but, actually, sort of not really, but really, they were like getting them all the time, at the point where, by the second inning, they had a 20-point lead due to home runs. That tends to not happen in baseball. I don't mean like, if that starts happening, they swap out the pitcher, because I swapped out the pitcher and they didn't fix it. That That's, that's a rarity. Um... You give credit where credit's due. Again, the batting screen is better. It is much better. It is... If it weren't for the other problems with the AI and them hitting so well, it would be the far superior batting. I would consider this, from a st batting standpoint, a superior game to RBI Baseball. Bases loaded superior on the fielding, but this would have been better in batting. But, that's, but other than that, that's it as far as that, that goes. It does give you more information in terms of stats for players, and you get much more control over your batting lineup and pitcher selection, um, to the point that you actually get to set up your lineup for players at the start of the game, as far as for their statistics and that sort of thing, and who you're putting in what order, which is something that not even Bases Loaded does, though it does give you more information. However, that's really all the good things I can say about this game. It it's terrible. It is not a good baseball game, and I cannot recommend it to anyone for any reason. Not even just to have something bad to laugh at. From here we move on to the new Counselor's Corner column, which is basically born out of all the letters that were in Fun Club News requesting advice. Um, probably the most notable material in this column is the small and basic screenshot map from Metroid, with all the weapon and boss locations plotted out. I would actually like if they did a larger version of this map in here, while I like the big map we get for um, some of the Mario 2 stuff, actually, rather the um, Legend of Zelda stuff in the fold-out map that was in this issue, this would have been nice, too. I wouldn't have minded if they did, like, the Legend of Zelda map on one side and then the castle, then the, um, the Metroid map on the other side or something like that. That would have been great. But this still is very, very useful. I can imagine some people, like, Yay, I don't have to use the graph paper anymore. But anyway, moving on. Next, we get one of the things that Nintendo Power, particularly in its early years, is most famous for, and the thing which made Howard Phillips a household name for many kids. The strip Howard and Nestor, 
the two, Howard the, with his bow tie and Nestor the young kid, basically make your standard straight man and silly man comedy duo. Howard the former, Nestor the latter. The formula for the series would basically go like this. Nestor will have difficulty getting past one portion of a game. This could be just sitting down and playing the game itself, or this could be some sort of fantastic scenario related to the game or dramatizing a section of the game. Nestor will come, Nestor will have just struggle and try to power through it while Howard attempts to give advi useful advice. Ultimately, either Howard will engage in the, will do it himself and demonstrate how it it's done, or Nestor will just follow the advice and then begrudgingly say, oh, I could have done it on my own anyway, or something to that effect. Later strips will again add more elaborate scenarios to this and dramatic situations like having, Nest having Nestor hanging out with the Ninja Turtles or on a movie set, but we'll get to those when we come to them. Next is the classified information column, which is the new version of the submitted cheat column. And the veracity of the cheats submitted here feel more, I guess the best way to put it would be verified and accurate now, as each cheat or trick has a screenshot to it showing the cheat in action. So you know that a counselor somewhere replicated the cheat and took a screenshot of it to show, yes, in fact, this works. We tried it. We know it works. We also have another article here on Double Dragon, including a much better look at the Bronson-esque art from the game, and some level maps. However, as I reviewed this game earlier, and there's nothing new or different to talk about here, I'm not going to review it again. Then we have an article on Gauntlet, which is our second Tengen game overall covered this issue, and I think overall in terms of the magazine as a whole. The article gives a rundown of the abilities for each of the four characters, and just under a handful of maps. Gameplay-wise, Gauntlet is okay. It is better than the arcade machine in some respects, and worse in others. It's better than the arcade version because the home version lets you use a password to continue with the game from the last vault you reached. It's better than the arcade version because it compensates for the option to buy more health quarters by using a leveling up system where every 50 treasure chests you get will boost your health. And also it automatically refills your health to full at whatever you're at depending on how many chests you've obtained at each vault you get to. It's worse than the arcade version, though, because while it doesn't give you the option to feed in more quarters to get more health, it still uses the health timer from the arcade version of the game, when really you don't need it in this version. You don't need the level of turnover on a home console that you need in an arcade cabinet to keep the money coming in, because you got their money when they bought the cartridge. The other problem is that the NES simply isn't able to handle the massive number of enemies and shots on screen at one time that you get with the game of Gauntlet, and it compensates for this in bad ways. In particular, rather than limiting how fast enemies spawn from monster generators, it instead limits the number of shots that your character can have on screen at one time. Thus, the game gives a sort of odd exponential difficulty curve based on the number of enemies that are on screen. It's awkward and makes the game more difficult than it really has to be. For our next game, Contra, we get a brief two-page article with maps for the first and third stages of the game, as you can't really do a map for the second stage, as it's the behind-the-back, forward-scrolling section of the game. As far as Contra's gameplay is concerned, well, this game was a classic, and it's a classic for a good reason. The controls are solid, which is important considering all the bullets you need to dodge, and all the platforming you have to deal with, and enemies who are rushing at you, and all that other stuff. The power-up selection is good, but the default pea shooter gun isn't so weak as to be useless against most enemies, which is good because if you die, you get reset to that gun. Basically, if I was to give one complaint about this game, it's that the strategies for this game basically live and die based on your muscle memory and trial and error. That said, because this game has the Konami code, and it gives you 30 extra lives per continue if you use it, that really compensates well and gives you that little handicap or crutch to build up that muscle memory so that you can go and beat the game again without it. Or, of course, you could just trudge through it over the course of a day or so, like with Arena on Game Center CX. Anyway, other than that, the game's graphics are very good um, for an NES game. The environments are interesting, and particularly, I like the shift from the sort of sci-fi environment and the jungle environments early on to the sort of 
techno-organic environments from the later levels of the game. I definitely recommend picking up this game. There's also a little double feature article here showing off two games based off of Merv Griffin's two most successful game shows, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. Both of these games are also rare joints, and I'm going to skip these because game show trivia games tend to be fairly meh if they're played single player, and that's how I'm playing these. So, unless they take the extra mile to give the game some extra character and flair to it, like with the You Don't Know Jack games, it's not particularly interesting, and I don't really recommend picking them up. Well, now we step out of the feature articles and into the more regular columns. And right off the bat, we have the Video Shorts column. For lack of a better term, this column basically fits into the category of the also-rans. Games which Nintendo Power staff didn't have space to feature, or didn't think would merit a feature on their own. For example, in this issue we have Legendary Rings, which is a sort of alternating top-down and backpack shoot 'em up Backpack shoot 'em up is what I call games where basically your main character is a human with their various portions of their anatomy hanging out in the breeze um, while flying around and shooting at stuff. Uh, typically it gives them a larger hitbox because they're standing upright or sitting in some sort of jetpack chair or something like that. Um, however, those, some of these games in here will get articles of their own later, like Bionic Command Commando. So, all the more reason to wait on some of these to see if they get more prominent coverage later. And then, at which point I'll talk about them more in depth then. After Video Shorts is Pack Watch, which is basically more also rans. Or, in this case, games that are coming out much, much later, and we have very little to say about them or show about them now. Generally, most games of this article either aren't coming out, or will come out much later, and will probably get more prominent coverage then, and so, all the more reason to hold off talking about them until then. Basically, if a game gets mentioned here by me, um, it'll be because it's something that either is a big game that is getting its first mention here, or is coming out... Never. It's like something like Mr. Gimmick, which we doesn't get a U.S. release. And so I'm kind of mentioning it to kind of talk about what could have been. We now come to the NES Journal, which is basically where the human interest stories get stuck that were in just the general news section of the Fun Club News. So here we have an article, for example, on the release of Dragon Quest III in Japan. By comparison, Dragon Quest I still hasn't gotten a... U.S. released yet, though it will later, and I'll talk about it when we come to that. There's also an article on the Vindicator arcade game from Atari. The game did get a home console release later, but that was after Tengen and Nintendo split in the perhaps least amicable fashion that two companies can split on in, and it was published as one of the infamous black cartridges. Also, we have information here about a video game tournament Konami held to promote their Top Gun game for the NES and get more people to buy it. There's also some entertainment news. We get blurbs for the films Vibes, Big Top Pee Wee, and Eight Men Out. Now, while all of these films are rated PG, albeit a 1988 PG, I do find it amusing that when they give previous works for some of the actors in these films, a lot of the time they pick films that were rated R. For example, for Charlie Sheen, they give Platoon. For John Cusack, they give Stand By Me. Gardens of Stone is the film they give for D.B. Sweeney. Julian Sands gets Gothic. And Jeff Goldblum gets David Cronenberg's The Fly, which really is a film that kids should not be watching. I'm not in denial. I know kids snuck into R-rated films back in the day, when you could get away with that sort of thing. Still, for a magazine aimed at kids and parents... You'd think they'd find other films to list, or give a little more thought to this than that. Like, I don't know, Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension for Jeff Goldblum, for example. Um, or for Julian Sands, I believe he was in, yeah, he, he was in Empire Strikes Back. Um, that sort of thing. Just something else. Something not R-rated. We then get a Celebrity Profile column. These columns basically all run the same way, with the meat of the article discussing whatever games the celebs being profiled are playing, bookended with whatever projects the celeb is currently working on and is currently promoting with this article, although technically what the article is really promoting is the games they're playing. But anyway, um, in this issue, Kirk and Candace Cameron talk about their 
sitcoms they're on, Kirk on Growing Pains, while Candace is on Full House. And rather than recapping the article, I'm just going to talk about where they are now, because that's really more interesting. Um, Candace is still working on family sitcoms, doing recurring roles and guest starring stuff on shows for ABC Family and the Disney Channel. Hey, working is good. Uh, Kirk, well, later on his Growing Pains run, possibly even at around the time this issue was published, well, Kirk found Jesus. Oh boy, did he find Jesus. He found Jesus so much that he started basically engaging in interference with the episodes to make sure that any material that he found inappropriate or to be too adult be excised from the show. This is kind of impressive, considering that normally the people who pull this kind of stuff off are people who have producer credit on the show, whether they're an actor who is also a producer on the show, like with um, William, P William Peterson on CSI, or they're writers or directors on the show, as actors often are for shows like this once they run long enough, or network standards and practices. And having checked, Kirk Cameron didn't really engage in any of those roles. He didn't contribute any writing material to the show. Uh, he didn't write any episodes, he didn't guest direct any episodes, and he didn't get a producer role on the series at any point. My best guess is for why he meant to get away with it, because oftentimes when an actor gets to be too much of a pain in the butt on the show and starts interfering too much and they get fired, is, well, Kirk Cameron is probably one of the bigger stars on Growing Pains. Unlike Full House, where Bob was basically a sort of more family-friendly vehicle for Bob Saget's stand-up comedy, Growing Pains didn't have a stand-up comedian attached to it as the main star of the show. Um, everyone on this was actors first, and didn't go into stand-up comedy or anything much later. Um, or at least they weren't known for stand-up comedy when they came in. Thus, when Kirk Cameron became a star through the show, I suspect it hit a point where... They probably couldn't fire him once he put his foot down and started interfering with the material without risking real audience backlash. And I can understand why. Sitcoms are all about the chemistry of the cast. And if you mess with that chemistry, even if it's to deal with a star who has got, potentially gotten too big for his britches, you risk having the show go downhill and get cancelled. And ad revenue is something we like, ladies and gentlemen. Um... As it is, now Kirk Cameron's religious views have basically kind of overwhelmed his career. To the point that all of his work in the last ten years has essentially been either Growing Pains reunion films, uh, fairly heavy-handed Christian films, possibly directed to video, and the Left Behind films, and, well, I'll just refer you to D. Amanda Hagen's reviews of those for information on that. Link in the show notes. Just to be clear, so there's no misunderstandings here. I don't have problems with people who are religious. If you're religious, if you are, if you found Jesus and he has helped you through addiction or any other problems you have in your life, more power to you. My main complaint here with Kirk Cameron is he's using, is that he used his religious beliefs to basically attack people whose creative works he objected to and to interfere with their creative process. I'm not saying that, well, Growing Pains was high art in terms of sitcoms or anything else for that matter, but he's not the writer, he's not the director, he's an actor, and while actors certainly have their artistic visions on their characters, I feel it was inappropriate of him to basically engage in executive meddling when really he wasn't in any sort of executive position. So, Anyway, let's, let's get past that and get back to talking about video games. Next is the top 40. Now, I'm not going to give a rundown of the scores here. What I will be doing is giving a little bit of analysis of the scores and seeing what games are on the top of the list and whether they've been featured in the magazine or not. And also, be, I'll be keeping track of the scores in a separate document. And at the end of each year of the magazine, I will give a rundown of the scores for the year and review the games that made the list, but that I haven't previously reviewed over the course of that year. I'll also give an overall top 30 for the magazine of, as a whole for the entire run thus far. That'll be at the end of each year. But so anyway, let's do my analysis. 
So, the top five titles on the list are first-party titles that have previously been featured in the Fun Club news. Not surprising. Actually, the entire top ten very nearly fits in that category as well, with only two third-party titles that previously haven't been discussed fitting into the list, Top Gun and Double Dribble. To be fair, the two both fit full niches that no first-party title that has been discussed previously fits. Uh, Double Dribble was, to my knowledge, the first basketball game to come out for the NES, and Top Gun was a licensed game based off an extremely popular movie, and in spite of what the angry video game nerd says, it plays pretty well until it comes to the whole fan of the plane part. So I think we can chalk the two up to lack of competition in Double Dribble's case, and from what I've heard, it's a solid game, so there's that part as well, and the success of the film was based on the latter case. The magazine, also from here on, every issue gives a breakdown of the scores based on various categories of people who were submitting their scores in the surveys. Players, pros, and dealers. Now, as someone who's taken classes in statistics, this section both fascinates me and frustrates me. Because I want to know, how does this data translate into the top 10 scores? Now, pros and players are probably voting based on the games they like the most they're currently playing. Um, but what about dealers? Are they voting based on the games that they like playing? Are they voting based on the games they're selling? And we can actually use this Maybe not so much as a metric for sales numbers, but to get a general idea of which games are selling better than other games. Um, specifically since we, at this time we didn't have like EGM running Babbage's sales figures in the magazine. So this is the kind of thing which I want to know how this is tabulated together. And I'm, I will try to find out information about this. Try to get in touch with Gail Tilden or Howard Phillips or somebody to give the information about how these figures turn into the top 30 because science and this section wraps this issue wraps up with a hype section for next issue as well as a little editorial from Howard plugging next month's issue sadly we don't have the crossword puzzles anymore I didn't do them but I kind of liked that they were there because I always felt like you know I should probably go back and do these later and now that they're gone I, I miss it so now for my pick of the issue this one's a toughie Contra and Mario 2 are both excellent titles, and it really depends on what you're looking for and kind of what you're playing it on. If you're looking for a game to get on your Wii Virtual Console, then it's Mario 2. Not because Mario 2 is inherently superior to Contra, they're both equal, but because, well, Contra isn't on the Virtual Console. I know it's shocking to me, too. I thought they were both on there. Contra is one of the classic NES games. It's, I guess you'd call it part of the third-party NES canon, as opposed to the first-party Nintendo canon. And I'm, I'm really surprised it's not on there. But it's not, so if you're going to the Virtual Console, get Mario 2. If you own the system and you're looking for a game to have for yourself, to because you want a collection of fun old retro games, not because you're trying to just collect everything. Well, I guess it depends, again, on your situation. If you're living by yourself, you're living in your apartment, you're playing games solo, Mario 2 is fine. It's a single-player game, so it's not like you're missing out on a, on a multiplayer experience here. But Contra, on the other hand, it is a, it is a fast, it's got fast, furious action, and it has simultaneous co-op with two players, as opposed to alternating like with the Mar like with Mario's one and three and on. So I definitely recommend um, going with Contra then, if, if you have someone to play with, because I think while Mario Two is fun and Contra is fun, having two people playing with you on Contra gives you that gets that extra little bit to the experience that you wouldn't have otherwise. So, next week, um, well, I've started two book series thus far. I've started The Elenium. I've started Season Flight. I have finished neither in terms of my reviews. Let's start a third series. I'm going to start out with the Hawkmoon series with Jewel and Skull. But fear not, my friends.
I read the omnibus, so everything's been already read, so don't worry about being left hanging. I'll see you then.